how God art present there. Consider your God tonight. Man, what a, what a mighty God we serve. You may be seated. Or should we sing, this is my father's world? No, nah, we'll let you off. Let's take our Bibles tonight and open together to the book of 1 Corinthians, please. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. And we come to God's Word tonight, kind of stemming somewhat from the morning message, but we remember that 1 Corinthians 15, surround, the topic surrounds the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Aren't you thankful that the Lord is risen from the dead? Remember, the gospel message is central to the, uh, uh, to the resurrection, and the resurrection is central to the gospel. If Christ is not risen from the dead, which we'll see tonight, our faith is vain, our message is vain, we are without hope, we are still dead in our sins. But now is Christ risen from the dead. And, and tonight as we come here this evening, I'd like for us to consider the, the, the resurrection tonight. In just a couple of weeks, we're going to gather together again. Resurrection Sunday is the second Sunday in April, uh, and we're very thankful that we have a risen Savior whom we can serve. Uh, but what does this mean for, for you and me? Uh, you know, we see here uh, throughout the book of, I'm sorry, this chapter of 1 Corinthians, we find the gospel, we see the, the necessity of the resurrection, we see the coming kingdom and that Christ will reign, uh, we find promises concerning His second coming and our, our future glorification with Christ. And, and all of these things, that we are, and then we are called to remain, uh, to remain faithful, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Consider the implications of the resurrection tonight, and the, the, the wonderful promises that God gives us. If you're able, let's stand again tonight. I feel like we've stood up and sat down quite a bit this evening. Um, but for respect of the Word of God, let's look here, beginning in verse number, verse number 12 of chapter 15. We'll read down through verse number 23. Notice what the Bible says. Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some of you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, there, then, uh, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead, and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the, fru the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Father, we're thankful for the promises of your word. Lord, we see some things here this evening, some truth that will remind us and, and revive us, God, of, the, of, your, of your promises and the great inheritance we have awaiting us in glory. Now, Lord, tonight we pray that you'd settle some issues in our hearts, if there be any. Lord, that you'd answer these questions, that you'd fortify our faith and, and help us be faithful till you come again. But Father, we love you. We pray for your blessing upon the message tonight. Lord, may you use it for your glory. Lord, speak to each of us, we pray, and we ask in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. If you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, I'd like to draw your attention to what the Word of God says in verse number 13. It's an interesting statement to, to take note of, but the Apostle Paul has, has set out here to prove a point. Remember, there's a, there's a heresy taking place within the church itself, the denial of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see that there is a great conglomerate of people that, that, uh, that uh, was in the church, that made up the church there in Corinth. There were people that were Stoics. There was Stoicism. Uh, there was uh, Platoism. Uh, there was 
you know, cynicism. Are there any cynics in here? No, I'm just kidding. But there were Epicureans as well. And all of these people denied the resurrection period. It wasn't just the resurrection from the dead. There was almost a, it was, it was like a breath of the, what the Sadducees believed. Remember, uh, the Sadducees, uh, they, they did not believe in the resurrection from the dead. That's why they are sad, you see. Right? There, there was no hope for them. And now we have a little bit of this attitude, this belief seeping into the church here in Corinth. And so the Apostle Paul addresses all of these all of this attitude, this, this false teaching, this heresy, because th- to deny the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ is, in fact, heresy. From, it, you know, there's, there's uh, our, our, our Muslim friends, they deny that Christ was, uh, was even crucified. And, and we, we often ask, well, uh, and, and they say that, you know, it was, it's all, it was just a misconception that at one point in the history of Christianity, the, the doctrine of soteriology changed. And that Christ did, you know, was actually switched out by, by Judas Iscariot at the last moment, and it was Judas who died on the cross and not Christ himself. But we always beg to ask the question, when did it change? When was there ever a time that, that we did not teach that the Word of God was not uh, preached that Jesus did in fact rise from the grave? When was there ever a time where, where it was taught that Christ did not die for our sins? May I tell you, there's never been a time. Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture. And that He was buried. And that He rose again the third day according to the Scripture. And so in verse number 13, there's an expression I'd like for you to note. And it's a, it's a, tr- it's a transitive uh, verb. It begins with a transitive verb. It says, if there be no resurrection of the dead. If there be no resurrection of the dead. What would that mean? What would that mean? If there were no resurrection of the dead. The word if, note the word if. I have the whole expression underlined. But then I circled that little transitive verb, if. The word if, it's it's used as a sign or condition or introduces a conditional sentence. And this is exactly what we find here. If Christ did not rise from the dead, then there are some sweeping implications here that must be considered. And we we look here tonight, and and there are are people everywhere. There are people who deny the gospel. There There are people who would deny that Christ died. There are people who would deny that Christ rose again. They would deny that Christ is coming again. They just deny the word of God. And may you and I not be named or numbered among those people. May we come to the word of God this evening with great conviction and understanding that Christ did rise. Because if he did not, you and I have no hope. So when we look back here in, in verse, in verse uh, number 19, in, the, in verse number 19 we quote it often. Verse number 19 is, is given in the context of this question, if. If Christ did not rise, if he's not alive, if he's not in heaven, if he's not going to come back for us, if there is no resurrection, if there is no salvation, if the gospel is null and void, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we're all, of all men, most miserable. Because we have no hope. We have no salvation. We are yet in our sins. And tonight, as we, as we consider this truth, I'd like to share with you two travesties and one truth. One truth that will encourage our hearts in the Lord tonight. Notice the travesty. If there be no resurrection of the dead, we find that our faith is vain. Everything we do is empty. That's what the word vain means. Remember what, the, uh, what Solomon wrote in the book of Ecclesiastes. He repeatedly spoke of vanity. Vanity of vanity, saith the preacher, all is vanity. Remember, life on earth apart from from the Lord is empty and it's meaningless. 
And as we consider the, the resurrection and the necessity of it, if there be no resurrection from the dead, our faith is vain. Everything that we believe, everything we hold to and profess, everything upon which we confidently stand, it's all vain. Then the word of God can't be true. Then Jesus Christ can't be God. Then there is no atonement for sin. You and I are of all men most miserable. Look what the Bible says in verse number 12 of chapter 15. He says, Now if, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ, notice verse 14, if Christ be not risen, then our preaching is vain. There's no point in being here tonight. There's no point sitting under the sound of, uh, of the word of God this evening. There's no, there's no point in any of it. It's vanity. It's vain. The world is full of vanity, isn't it? The world is, is empty. There is nothing that satisfies. There's nothing that the world can offer you that will satisfy your soul. And if Christ be not risen from the dead, if he's still dead, then our, then our preaching is vain. Not even this can help. There are, there's a whole multitude of false religion in the world today, isn't there? The world is not short of false religion. I mean, I tell you what they do is vain. The Bible speaks of vain repetition. The Bible, you know, our good works are vain. It's not by works of righteousness which we have done. All of our works, it's all vain, it's all trivial, it's all nonsense, it's of no avail, no profit. Our preaching is vain. The Bible goes on to say in verse 14, and your faith is vain also. It's interesting because the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. And so if there is no truth in what we preach, then our faith is null and void. Because the only reason I believed in Jesus Christ is because I sat under the preaching of God's Word. And I was persuaded by a preacher based upon the truth of Scripture that Jesus is who the Bible says He is. And that He did what the Bible said He did. And then I can have salvation through his finished work, just as the Bible clearly and implicitly teaches. But if Christ is not risen from the dead, then it's, it's all vain. Our preaching is vain. Our faith is vain. And notice what he says in verse number 15. He says, in yea, at yea, and we be found false witnesses of God. Remember the Apostle Paul, he made the statement, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ be made of none effect. When Christ sent him to baptize, he was, he was commissioned by God himself. And he came, and he preached, not according to man's wisdom, but according to God's wisdom. I was talking with someone today, and, and, I, and I, tell, I, I, I say this often, what I have to offer is a to you. You do not want what I have to say. Your faith ought not be built upon me. It ought to be built upon the Word of God. We consider the truth of the Word of God tonight. And, and we come and, and, and we reference the Word of God often. The Bible says, why do I say that? Because it's not me who says it. It's the Word of God that says it. And our faith is based on the Word of God. So as the Apostle Paul went to Corinth, and as he preached the Gospel, as he, as he told them of how Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scripture, and that He was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve, and then of above five hundred brethren at once. As he went and as he, as he preached, you know what he was preaching? He was preaching God's word. He went and he said, you know what? God sent me here to give you this message. And if God told him to say it, that means he's a false witness of God. Let God be true. And every man a liar. 
Paul, he said that uh, we, are, uh, we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ to me, raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. Notice another travesty. Not only is our faith vain, these are intricately connected, <laughs> but that means that We are still dead in our sins. Look what the Bible says in verse number 16. It says, For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Do you see the necessity of the resurrection of the dead? If Christ be not raised, we are dead in our sins. There is no forgiveness. That means that you and I must incur the full penalty of our sin. The wrath of God still abides upon us. But Christ died for our sins, according to the Scripture. And that He was buried and that He rose again the third day, according to the Scripture. Not only are we still yet in our sins, but all of our loved ones, all of our loved ones, who have trusted in the Lord and have gone on to heaven before us, they perished. They, they are not in heaven. They are not in the presence of God. Their faith did not become sight. They too have incurred the wrath of God and are like the rich man. Lift up his eyes in hell being tormented in the flame. They're in the place where the worm dieth not. A place of eternal torment. Church tonight, there are people in the world, there are branches and offshoots of, and I use the term loosely in this context, Christianity that would deny the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They are yet in their sins, and it's very sad, isn't it? Those are the travesties. But there's a great truth. Look what the Word of God says in verse number 20. And if you've not yet marked this statement in your Bible, I encourage you to do so. The Bible says in verse number 20, But now is Christ risen from the dead. But now is Christ risen from the dead. Presently, <laughs> now is. He's alive forevermore. He tasted death for every man, but now he's alive forevermore. We have a great high priest who has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our profession of faith. For now, but now is Christ risen from the dead. What does this mean for you and me? See, just like there's implications for there not being resurrection, there is wonderful truth for there being resurrection. Aren't you glad that Jesus rose again? Where did the, 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 the teaching of the resurrection begin? The Jews of old have always believed in the resurrection. The Sadducees would deny it, but the Jews believe that there is. Look here what he says concerning Christ in verse number 20. He says, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become, note the word, first fruits. He is the first fruits of them that slept. The first fruits. I want you to look with me, if you would, please, in the Old Testament book of Exodus. In Exodus chapter number 23. 
we find that the Jews observed the feast of first fruits. Consider the offerings that were made to the Lord. And we, we see here that the command of God, beginning in verse number 16 of Exodus chapter number 23, he says, And the feast of harvest, the first fruits of thy labors. And note the word there in verse 16, first fruits. You know, we, we are told that we were to honor the Lord with our substance and the first fruits of all our increase. We, we give to the Lord that, that tithe, that tenth, that portion that, that He asks of us, that He demands of us. It's our, it's our job, our duty. It's been said that the tithe is the seed that we sow. In giving, you know, is in, in our giving. But we honor the Lord with our first fruits. But what is this first fruits? In Exodus chapter 23. He says, which thou hast sown in the field, in the feast of ingathering, which is in the end of the year, when thou hast gathered in thy labors out of the field, three times in the year, all thy males shall appear before the Lord God. Thou shalt not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leavened bread, neither shall the fat of thy sacrifice remain until the morning. The first of the first fruits of thy land Thou shalt bring into the house of the Lord thy God. Thou shalt not see the kid in his, in his mother's milk. But there's this first fruit offering. It's symbolic. You know what? It, 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 it implies the fact that there's going to be more. There's going to be more. So when the Word of God tells us that Christ is the first fruits of them that slept, concerning his resurrection from the dead. He's the first fruits. What does this mean? It means there's going to be more of us. This is just the beginning of what the Lord has done. This is the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. Be in other words, because Christ is risen from the dead, there is a resurrection that each of us can be part of. Jesus Christ is the first fruits of them that slept. Look back with me, if you would, please. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, you see that Christ is alive. He's risen. He's the first fruits. But on the heels of this, we also find that Christ is the second Adam who brings life. Look what he says in verse number 21. He says, For since by man came death. Who, who, where did this death come from? It came from, from Adam. Hold your place here and look with me, if you would please, in Romans chapter number 5. Romans chapter number 5. So death came by man. We understand this. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve sinned, they transgressed the command of God, they ate of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they sinned, and, and death came upon them. But the word of God says in verse number 12 of Romans 5, Wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Why, do, why, do, why does man die? We die because of our sin. So if, if death came by man, then life has to come by man. That's why Jesus became sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. He did the work that you and I could not do, but He had to become man to do it. He became man without ceasing to be God. Look what the Word of God says back in John chapter number 1. In John chapter number 1, the Bible says in verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus is eternal God. He never had a beginning. He's always been. His beginning did not begin. Right? His beginning did not begin. In Mary's womb. Neither did his beginning begin uh, in the manger. 
He is eternal God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But we look down in verse number 14 of the same chapter, John 1 and verse 14, the Bible says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus became man without ceasing to be God. Why? Well, he tells us repeatedly in the gospel records that he came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. And to give his life a ransom for many, Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. He came to die for you, to die for me. But consider this truth. He came not only to die, he came to defeat death. Anybody can die. I can die. You can die. I don't want to, nor do you. But that's not the hard part. The hard part is the resurrection. Jesus tasted death for every man. And as a man and for a man, he died. He took upon us, or I'm sorry, he took upon himself the sins of the whole world. Look what the Bible says in Colossians. Colossians chapter number 2. The Word of God says in, in verse number 9 concerning Christ and His deity. For in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in Him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with Him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen. Ye are what? Ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him having forgiven you all trespasses blotting out the handwriting of ordinances which was against us which was contrary to us and took it out of the way nailing it to the cross and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Christian, understand this, that the Lord paid your penalty. He died for you. He rose again. If we even look back in, verse, in chapter number 1, the Bible says in verse number 18 of chapter 1, it says, And he, speaking of Christ, is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death, to present you holy and unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. Church, understand that Christ died for you. He became sin for you. He paid your penalty. He died as you. And he's alive. You see, Adam sinned. And Adam died. And he passed along that sin to every one of his prodigy. You, me, we've all sinned. But you and I can all live because of what Christ has done. You know, there's, there's going to be a great day could happen any moment when the Lord comes back for his church you look back with me if you would please in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15 
we find the promise that Christ is coming for you. He's coming for his bride. Yesterday, I, I performed a funeral service for a lady I'd never met before. She's 95 years old. Moved to Columbus in 1953. Moved from the coal fields of West Virginia to Columbus in 1953. But at some point in her teenage years, as her father was a Baptist preacher, she placed her faith in Christ. And it was easy to preach her funeral, even though I did not know her. Because you and I have hope. You see, our loved ones that Paul addressed previously here in this passage of Scripture, look back, he says in verse 18, then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. There are loved ones that have fallen asleep in the Lord. They've died, having accepted Christ as their Savior. What happens to these people? Look down in verse Number 22, it says, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But in verse 23, it says, But every man in his own order. Every man in his own order. What does this mean? Does this mean that there's a line that you have to get in? It's like we're going to the BMV, and we have to draw a number and wait for 10 hours while you navigate through the line. Is that what we're talking about? No. He's talking here about the order of the resurrection. See, Christ, remember, Christ is the first fruits. And then, notice what he says in, in verse number 23, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ's at his coming. What is this coming that the Lord is referring to? Well, we find it in 1 Thessalonians. Look there, if you would, please. 1 Thessalonians, chapter number 4. You see, the church in Thessalonica, though it was young, it was very strong. It was, a, it was a vibrant, healthy church. But there were some who came into the church and, and brought in this, this false teaching that Christ had already come and that they had been left behind. And now Paul writes, he says, hey, don't worry. He hasn't come back yet. He will he just hasn't yet. You're okay. And he gives words of comfort. And you see there, in the word of God, there are three resurrections, if my memory serves me right. Jesus Christ is the first fruit of the resurrection. He's the first one to rise from the dead. The second resurrection is for those who have fallen asleep in Christ. The ones that the Lord resurrects at the rapture. There's a third resurrection which takes place at the end of the millennial kingdom. When Christ resurrects all those who've ever lived, who have died, having not received Christ as their Savior, whose names are not written down in the Lamb's book of life. They're resurrected not to life, but unto eternal damnation. That's why the Lord says in Revelation chapter 20, I believe it is, blessed are they who have part in the first resurrection. Talking about the resurrection that we find here at the, at the rapture. You know what? There's a possibility that you won't be resurrected. Did you know that? I hope I don't get resurrected. I, I'm praying that I'm still alive at the coming of our Lord. And, uh, but look here what the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. And we see that transitive verb again. He says, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. 
For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with the shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. There's your resurrection. This is the resurrection that Paul is referring to in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This is the order, Christ, the first fruits, and these here at his coming. He says in verse 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. You see, even in ch- later on in chapter number 15 of 1 Corinthians, we find reference to the Lord's coming again. Look what he says in verse number 52, uh, or verse, verse 51. He says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. You know, there's, it speaks of the resurrection there earlier on in the, in the, in the verse. This, this resurrection according to the proper order there. Christ the first fruits. And then uh, afterward, they that are Christ that is coming. But for you and me, there is great hope. What happens to us? You know, we, we, we always have that, that um, our, our imagination runs wild, doesn't it? Uh, what's it going to be like when the dead rise? You know what? I don't believe the graves are going to open up. I don't believe that at all. Because the bodies are going to be glorified. There's no need for a grave to open if the body can just rise. And you and I, our bodies, our physical bodies, will be changed. You know what? I'm going to be a whole lot better looking than I am now. I mean, I'm already, I know. But I'm just teasing. But just imagine our glorified bodies. All the back pain that we have, it's going to be gone. Praise the Lord. No more aches, no more pains. Perfect. Just as God intended for us to be from the beginning. Amazing. But he says there in verse 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but We shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trump shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So in this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass... The saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Why can this be? It's because Christ is alive. He's he's risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay. You and I, have something to look forward to, don't we? Let's look here as we close. Let's look at verse 58 of chapter 15 once more. It says, therefore, my beloved brethren, because Jesus is coming back, because we have life, because we have salvation, because it's not vain, because it is true, 
Because He is God. Because atonement has been made. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. It's not in vain. It's not in vain. If there is no resurrection, it's vain. For as much as ye know, your labor is not in vain. It's real. It's true. So what then is the call that God extends? It's the call to be faithful. Just be faithful. Continue living for Christ today because he just might come back tomorrow. You know what? He could come back today. There's nothing, there's nothing hindering his coming. There's not one piece of Bible prophecy that must be required before he comes back. His return is imminent. Therefore, may God find us faithful. Will you live faithfully for Jesus Christ? Will you be consistent? Will you be a faithful witness? Will you point other people to the hope that we have in the Lord? with our heads bowed and our eyes closed.